Freshly out of the Hare Krishna cult and brand new to pop culture, MTV had me hooked. <laughs> Until I was 13 years old, I was fully immersed in Hindu culture, including music and movies. After getting kicked out of the last Hare Krishna school I would ever attend, for disobeying school rules and publicly calling out the leaders for their rampant hypocrisy, I moved in with my dad who had escaped a few, the movement a few years earlier. He started a new life, and I chose happily to live with him. While devotional music was inspiring and Bollywood movies were entertaining, they weren't exactly cool, at least not back then. And I so wanted to be cool. In my Hare Krishna schools, I was at the top of the social hierarchy, making a name for myself as the rising rebel, willing to call bullshit as needed and protect anyone who couldn't speak up for themselves. However, in my Catholic school, I was quite awkward and quiet. I was the new girl and well below cool in the social hierarchy of eighth graders. From clothes to music, I had a whole lot to learn. My dad was a recording engineer and he worked late in the afternoons into the early morning, recording with musicians like Gloria Estefan, Shaka Khan, James Brown, just to name a few. We didn't see much of each other. When I was home, when he was home, I was in school. And when I was home, he was working. Quite often, I was left to my own devices. Soap operas and MTV became my surrogate role models for how to look and act normal. <laughs> my education in pop culture was Guiding Light, <laughs> Jerry Lewis movies, I Love Lucy, The Carol Burnett Show, I Dream of Jeannie, and Bewitched. I watched closely, eagerly soaking up every nuance I could so I could look, feel, and sound like a normal American teen. When I met my neighbor, Laura, she introduced me to music videos and my world changed. So long soap operas, hello MTV. Laura became my new best friend. We went to the same Catholic school, so every day we'd walk home together. We changed from our pastel colored pinstripe uniforms and saddle shoes and into our ripped jean shorts and concert tees. And while the South Florida humidity was not kind to my curls, I would take my hair down from my neatly coiffed Catholic school approved ponytails and let it loose. I might have looked like an electrocuted Q-tip, but something about it made me feel rebellious and wild, perfect for watching MTV. Laura was in love with some guy named Simon Lebon. <laughs> she talked about him and his band endlessly. Naturally, I was curious. I had seen all the usual videos, Aha, Tears for Fears, Madonna. But a new video was premiering and she made me watch it with her. We sat on her floor in front of the large screen TV, each with a 24 ounce Coke Slurpee in one hand and a bowl of Fruit Loops near the other. <laughs> Anticipating the release of a new video from her favorite band, we waited impatiently. The camera infuriatingly focused on Simon, which made Laura happy, but I wasn't that impressed with him. I'd definitely seen cuter guys in real life. <laughs> then, off to the left of the screen, I noticed a tall figure with flowing hair playing the bass. The camera focused even closer, and it was the most perfect looking male I had ever seen. His perfectly formed face, high cheekbones, full smirking lips, impeccable jawline, and twinkle in his eye, there was John Taylor. <laughs> I must have died and gone to, gone to some kind of hot guy heaven. From that day on, I, saw, I sat with Laura for hours on end, suction cupped to her TV, waiting for any glimpse of Duran Duran, giggling as we spent every day of eighth grade and the summer thereafter in a sugar-filled stupor, fantasizing about our lives as rockers' wives. My fantasy was particularly alive and plausible because my dad's best friend, Alex Sadkin, had just produced Seven and the Ragged Tiger, Duran Duran's wow. third album. Alex was movie star handsome and talented. Before becoming a successful person in the music industry, Alex felt called to become a turtle farmer. <laughs> he gave it a go for a few months, but quickly realized that turtle farming is really, really boring. <laughs> Leaving behind his turtles, Alex focused solely on his music career. My dad was a brilliant guitarist and with his bound band soundtrack, played among some of the greatest musicians at the time. However, he too took a detour and joined the Hare Krishnas for several years and then returned to music. 
My dad and Alex were impressively talented and passionate about music and pursued their careers like a man might pursue a hot, moody girlfriend. Involvement in the music business is often like this, a torrid love affair, all-consuming with little immediate reward for all that effort. But somehow, Alex made it big, inking a deal with Duran Duran. As any opportunistic teen might do, I asked my dad to ask Alex if he would introduce me to Duran Duran. Of course, Alex said, even offering me to give me tickets and backstage passes when the, when the band toured South Florida. The mere prospect of meeting John Taylor made me feel hopeful and that perhaps I would join the ranks of the cool crowd. Soon after I was assured of meeting the band, one of the celebrity magazines ran a story on John getting engaged to a very tall, very gorgeous Renee Simonson, a supermodel of epic proportion. At 5'2", with curly, frizzy hair and a chubby little belly, I didn't stand a chance. My heart broke just a little bit, my dream dashed, I threw away my I had sex with John Taylor button and went on my way, <laughs> meeting other eighth grade dorks and living out a normal eighth grade year. <laughs> Two years later, when I was in 11th grade, on a regular, three years later, when I was in 11th grade, on a regular sunny afternoon, I came home from school to find my dad in tears. His best friend, my only connection to John Taylor, had been killed in a Jeep accident in the Bahamas. Alex wasn't wearing a seatbelt when his Jeep flipped causing severe head trauma and killing him short after. I cried for my dad's loss and for Alex's death and for my missed opportunity. Alex's family brought his body home to Fort Lauderdale for the funeral where friends and family laid to rest their dear friend. When my dad came home from the service, red-eyed and heavy-hearted, he brought home with him a vase of black roses. They were from Duran Duran. The band was on tour and unable to attend the service and I kept those roses for a very long time. They somehow comforted me that not all was lost and that there would still be some small chance I would meet the band. Over time, I found other music and other bands I loved. I moved to California, had a baby, went to college, got married, but never far from my mind was the thought, what if? One day, my husband at the time surprised me with tickets for Duran Duran concert at the Santa Barbara Bowl. He knew I loved him, but until the concert, I don't think he knew how much of a crush I had on John. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't realize I still had one. I think it actually made him a little uncomfortable. This was the first time I saw I would see Duran Duran in person. John was quite a bit older, and yet, as I sat next to my husband, I found myself totally mesmerized with this ridiculously charming and handsome rock star. Like a 13-year-old smitten and giddy, I ecstatically listened, watched, and sang along to every song I knew. We are going to meet them, I declared. I have a crazy idea. My husband, was, who was used to my crazy ideas, kept pace as I hurriedly walked explaining my idea. We'll stand next to the line of people who have legit backstage passes, and when they leave, I'll throw on the charm and ask him for their passes. He thought I was a little nuts, but stood by me. I think he was kind of excited, too. The first few people said no. Disappointed, but persisted, I kept asking. Persistent, I kept asking. I wasn't going to let this opportunity slip. My husband continued to stand guard as I approached strangers who had already met the band. Finally, two men, having freshly met them and on the way out, said yes, and, I, and easily handed over their passes. Holy cow, I couldn't believe it. I jumped up and down and kissed my husband. We quickly got in line. This was really gonna happen. Holding hands and giddy with our cleverness, we waited. Within a few minutes, a man came out and made an announcement. I stood, I went up closer and stood to hear, the guys are really tired and heading out to the airport for the next leg of the tour. They won't be taking any more visitors. Sorry, guys. This was just cruel. My heart sank, my <laughs> face turned red. I nearly cried. Quickly, I reined in my disappointment. I didn't want my husband to know how sad I really felt. If that's as close as I ever get to John Taylor, I decided to be grateful. I squeezed my husband's hand and we left. Years later, after my divorce, and no, it wasn't because of John Taylor, <laughs> I went to another Duran Duran concert at San Diego State Open Air Theater with some of my girlfriends. We laughed the entire concert. Their music just didn't excite me for the first, and for the first time, I thought the whole thing was pretty goofy. My obsession with John Taylor was, a go was gone. He was still the most handsome guy I'd ever seen, but I didn't need to meet him anymore. Instead of getting lost in my teenage fantasies about John, I just had fun. In an interview with John Taylor's wife, she gracefully dispelled the myth of the rocker. She said, 
He farts just like everyone else. <laughs> Thank you. That was Vanessa Wilde.